Good afternoon. Changing your mind, marijuana in the brain. That's the topic for this afternoon. I did appreciate our previous speaker. It was a wonderful presentation of the painstaking, laborious events that surround getting cogent data that take years and decades. Most of the information that I will be conveying with you today is derived from people other than myself. This is not my own research on cannabinoids. I've done a little of it, but I felt that uh, so much of it was um, uh, preclinical that it, uh, it would not have the impact that some of the more, um, the more human-based data would have with regard to some of the, over, the points of view that I'd like to present. So <clears throat> what we'll do is give a, a scientific history of marijuana how does marijuana produce its effects? Marijuana in the adolescent and marijuana addiction and psychosis in adults. We will have a speaker to describe the psychosis, so I won't get into much detail on it. In 1964, an Israeli researcher isolated the active ingredient of marijuana cigarettes called Delta 9 Tetra hydrocannabinol, and if anybody wants to know what the Greek symbol is, I'll show it on the structure in a moment. And then animal and human studies demonstrated unequivocally that most of the psychoactive components of marijuana smoking were due to THC. The link between marijuana and schizophrenia was demonstrated, and then, about a decade later, marijuana was shown to be addictive and promote withdrawal. And then, Aline Howlett, a person who I collaborated with on some cannabinoid research, she showed that there is, in fact, a target for marijuana in the brain. We call it a receptor. It's a protein that takes the marijuana and reacts to it by creating a signal. Following that, the gene for this target was discovered, and then the marijuana targets or receptors in the brain were mapped. And then it was discovered that in fact there are cannabinoids produced by the brain and produced by organs in the rest of the body. And then, in the past decade, we have uncovered an, a vast array of functions that these cannabinoids perform. The endocannabinoids, we call them endocannabinoids because they're endogenous, they're made by our own selves in learning, in pain, in opioid-seeking behavior. So how does marijuana produce its effects? We've already described this morning that brain communication has parallels to human communication. A transmitter, a message, and a receiver in the same way that the, when two nerve cells want to talk to one another, they have a transmitter which is one cell, it squirts out a message which happens to be a chemical, the next cell beside it receives the message and interprets it. The brain has a hundred billion of these cells. Just imagine a hundred billion telephones. And on top of that, it has over, it, it has a trillion of other types of cells that help these nerve cells communicate. And each of one of these can have one to 10,000 connections. <coughs> And these connections form the basis of communication, and they're very tightly regulated. Now, how does the system work? The chemical message can be something like dopamine or serotonin or um, uh, lurometencephalin or acetylcholine, many days. There are about 120 different types of chemical messages that the brain produces, glutamate, GABA, etc. And then a cell wants to give a message to the next cell, wants to talk to the dopamine receptors, the 
the interpreters. So it begins to squirt out the messages. They float across this little space and they tell the next cell, do this or do that, react, get excited or calm down. Now, the brain also has a cannabinoid system that transmits messages. But it's very different than the regular ones. In, and it's different for the following reason. Instead of sending a message from one to the other, what it does is it, it prevents the release of messages. It stops them from being produced. So we have endocannabinoids, we have receptors, but they're in the receiving cell, these messages. And they go backwards, upstream, to where most messages are sent, and they stop them from being formed. It's as if every time you wanted to talk to somebody on the phone, I would send out a signal that blocks your conversation. Now, the interesting thing is that this cannabinoid system is in very, very large amounts all over the brain. And the messages it blocks are many different types of different chemicals, different signaling systems. And you can begin to conjecture that this is why the cannabinoids have been implicated in so many functions. It's complicated. It's far more complicated than the story I'm giving you. But let's just summarize quickly. A cannabinoid is made by the brain. THC is made by a plant. There are at least seven types of cannabinoids made in the brain. The plant makes about 60. And that little circle that I just pointed out to you is why we have a delta Greek sign 9. Because delta refers to a double bond, a carbon that's bound twice. Very simple. And 9 is the position on the molecule. So when you see delta 9, don't be intimidated. It's a very simple concept. We have 60 or more cannabinoids made in the plant, but we currently have thousands of cannabinoids made by drug companies, by academics, because everyone has become extremely interested in this system. And we will very shortly discover why. The first and probably one of the most intriguing findings when this whole process of discovery began was to ask the question, where in, this, where in the brain are these systems? And what, it, what was found is that the brain has them in places that are not surprising considering what marijuana does. You can find cannabinoid systems in a brain region involved in learning and memory, in motor learning and coordination, in pain perception, in hormone release, in motor activity, and, and in responding to addictive drugs, and in brain areas involved in long-term memory and motor function. So wherever those bright yellow regions are, that's where the cannabinoid system is, and you can begin gradually to see that the science converges with what we observe after giving or after one, one gives marijuana. We know that marijuana interferes with memory, with coordination. We know that it affects pain perception, it affects motor activity, it affects hormones. Men who use marijuana can have enlarged breasts and, and adolescents as well. And we know that marijuana can affect hormone systems. Now, we've heard from legalizers throughout the world that marijuana is a benign drug because it doesn't kill. It doesn't have the potential deaths that opioids do. And that is true. One of the reasons is that in the brainstem, which controls breathing, 
there are a lot of opioid receptors present. And if you interfere with those receptors, if you overactivate them, you can have difficulty breathing. The cannabinoid system is not present there. That's why it does not cause an overdose. Is that give us reason to relax with this drug? It does not. In humans, those were rat studies in humans, we find them in exactly the same places. In regions that are involved with drug reward, with motor activity, with uh, learning memory, with coordination, and so on and so forth. What are the functions of the natural cannabinoids in the brain? What do they do in the brain? This, what does the, why is the brain harboring what we would consider a very puzzling system? The cannabinoid receptor called CB1, which stands for cannabinoid, which is the target of marijuana in the brain, is found in brain cells. It modulates appetite. It modulates pain. It modulates learning and memory. It's also present in the placenta and uterus, and it regulates pregnancy to some extent, fertility implantation, fertility implantation, and maintenance of pregnancy. It's found in nerve terminals of the skeleton. It is involved with opioid addiction and marijuana addiction. And there's another cannabinoid receptor called the CB2, <clears throat> which marijuana does not touch at all, but our own cannabinoids do. And they promote the growth of new brain cells. They are deeply embedded in our immune system, in our inflammatory response, in our gastrointestinal tract, in our liver, cardiovascular system, in lung airways. There, this cannabinoid system is everywhere, in the body, in the brain, doing multiple, multiple functions. And it's going to take years, not only to understand how it works, but also what are the potential ways that we can develop drugs that are not psychoactive, that don't produce hallucinations and paranoia and cognitive impairment and memory impairment, but drugs that can affect these systems in a beneficial way and yet not, not knock out our brain function. So what are the differences between these endocannabinoids and marijuana? First of all, marijuana is not an endocannabinoid. Endocannabinoids enhance the processes that are implicated in learning. They're called full agonists. That means when they hit the receptor, they produce a full-blown response. The active ingredient of marijuana does not. Sometimes it blocks the receptor or partly blocks it. Why? Because the structure is not identical. It's different than what our brains produce. The same way that LSD is different than serotonin. The same way that dopamine is different than cocaine. The same way that morphine or heroin are different than beta-endorphin, which is our own natural opioid. And the endo endogenous cannabinoids, they function at CB2 receptors, a major target of interest for therapeutics. But marijuana is not an endocannabinoid. Instead of enhancing the processes of memory, it interferes with learning and memory. And you can see that directly in a test tube. It's a partial activator. It's not a full it promotes opioid drug-seeking in rodents. There's no evidence that endos do, and it does not function at, at the CP2, a CB2 receptor. Now, here's something that's complicated but fascinating. In mice, you can genetically engineer a mouse in the embryonic phase to simply eliminate the cannabinoid receptor, get rid of it, the CB1. Just It'll never, never, never show up in the adult mouse. 
And why is that such an important tool? It's fascinating. It's important because it gives you an ability to understand what the role is of this target for marijuana. What does it do? So if you give THC to an animal, you will get analgesia. You'll, remove, you'll reduce motor responses. You'll reduce blood pressure. You'll slow heart rate. You'll reduce temperature. And you'll eat more. That's what cannabinoids do in rats. But if you get rid of the CB1 receptor, they're called knockout mice or no mutant mice, the analgesia is gone. There's no change in motor activity. Blood pressure doesn't go down. Heart rate doesn't go down. Temperature doesn't change. And interestingly enough, the animal's desire to seek opioids like morphine or heroin goes down. So it means that marijuana or the cannabinoid system facilitates the liking, the desire for opioids. That's very interesting. And that doesn't generalize to cocaine or nicotine. And the animals eat less. So this very clever system, and it's very complicated to do this, these kind of studies that have been done by others. You can actually understand what the system is doing in the brain. What about marijuana and adolescence? Let's look at a theory on how marijuana spreads throughout a community. The increased susceptibility to addiction, the risk of addiction to other drugs, and its effects on cognition, performance, and the future. <laughs> Marijuana use has declined in the past decade in high school students. This was a, a, quite a, a, a significant decline of over 25%. I showed this earlier this morning. Very complicated slide. It looks like modern <coughs> art. It really isn't. First, let's look at the cue. The boxes are males, the circles are females. <coughs> the size of the circles or squares are how much marijuana is used. If it's red, the person sleeps six hours or less. A teenager, teenagers who need much more sleep than six hours. And if they sleep seven hours, it's brown. And eight hours, it's white. So eight hours is appropriate, and as you get darker and darker, you're sleeping less, and as you get bigger and bigger, you're consuming more marijuana. And what you can see first doesn't take rocket science. The less you sleep, the more you use marijuana, or the more you use marijuana, the less you sleep. And most of this, in terms of cluster, is male, the drivers. And then all of these little lines that connect the circles and squares, those are friends. The friendships have been mapped in great detail, the contacts and the friendships. And what you see is that the closer you are to the center, the closer you are to the habits of the center so that there's a cluster of marijuana users at the center that don't get much sleep, and as you move further away, you find there's less marijuana use. So you can actually map the networks, almost like you can map the circuits in a computer or in the brain. You can map the networks of young adolescents. This was done, as I said, by Stockus and his colleagues at Harvard. And what he found is that the poor, poor sleep was associated with higher marijuana use. And poor sleep and marijuana use spread through social networks. And the people who were at the center, at the crossroads, were more vulnerable. The people closest to the ringleaders, so to speak, and four degrees of separation, which means I know the person sitting in the front row, but I don't know the person in the second row, 
but they know the front row, and the third row knows the second row. Even the fourth row that I don't know, I've never spoken to, just by the fact that I'm connecting one-to-one -one, these people, I can influence the person in the fourth row by going through row one, two, and three. So what it was found is that even four degrees of separation, even with large social distances, the probability of marijuana use was still present. And this kind of mapping has been done for alcohol as well as for nicotine. And it's extremely important in terms of prevention because once you begin to get a sense of how these, these conditions, these influences spread on a network basis with real human beings, you can begin to address and target them. I've already described the increased susceptibility of marijuana, of early marijuana use to addiction and the elevated addiction for other drugs. The question is, what is the mechanism? And I speculated earlier, it's because the adolescent brain is unformed. It's not fully developed, it's developing, and the introduction of drugs could change the trajectory of development. It could change the circuitry. And right here in Sweden at the Karolinska Institute, Maria Elgren and Yasmin Hurd, Maria was doing her PhD with Yasmin Hurd, who was her supervisor, and she did a very clever experiment that was published just a few years ago, in which she exposed young rats, adolescent rats, to marijuana, and then <clears throat> let them clear the marijuana from their life for, until they grew up. And then she exposed them to heroin. And the animals that had been exposed to marijuana as adolescents had higher heroin seeking rates than those who had never seen marijuana as adolescents. Which showed this very tight link between heroin seeking and marijuana seeking. She also showed that the brains of these marijuana uh, exposed adolescents were different and they were different not only in the opioid system, they were different in the cannabinoid system as well. They had been changed during adolescence and as adults there was a difference that was perceptible. So now we know that there is a risk of addiction to other drugs and interestingly in humans if you initiate marijuana by the age of 14, your lifetime use of cocaine is much higher. And that's true, and it decreases with age of initiation to other drugs. What about other consequences? High school performance, college performance. <clears throat> a study was done, a longitudinal study, 10 year study, on over 2,000 young people, in which they compared abstainers from marijuana with experimenters or frequent users. And the purpose of showing the study in the beginning, they thought would demonstrate that kids who abstain from marijuana were kind of not normal. They would be the unusual ones. They wouldn't be the ordinary risk-seeking of adolescents. And somehow their lives would be compromised by not being drug-seeking. They stated that in the paper, that that was their original theory. And then in the end, they had to retract that theory because the data showed the opposite. And this is a combination of this paper and another one. But they spent more time on homework, those who abstained from marijuana. Higher grades. They graduated college at much higher levels. Even the experimenters had a half of the college graduation rates. As adults, they engaged in less stealing and much less drug selling. So their Abstaining from marijuana was correlated with a, a healthier lifestyle as adults.
And we have data with college students that's equally disconcerting with marijuana. Nearly 10% of first year college students at one university have a cannabis use disorder. They have concentration problems, they put themselves in physical danger, they drive after using marijuana, they give up important activities, and so on and so forth. So, there's also a correlation between age of use of marijuana combined with psychotic symptoms and schizophrenic symptoms of later on. There is some evidence that adolescent abstinent marijuana users have abnormal sizes of the cerebellum, the brain area that I showed you accumulates huge amounts of marijuana involved in learning motor function. And we can go on and on and on and show you multiple slides, including addiction and marijuana. But let's just summarize and close now. Marijuana is an addictive drug. The evidence now is unequivocal, and it appears that it will enter into the new Diagnostic and Statistical Manual 5. The progression to addiction is as rapid as nicotine, more rapid than alcohol. Tolerance and withdrawal may reflect more severe addiction, and progression to addiction is more rapid in young people. The withdrawal symptom is irritability, restlessness, nervousness, tension, very similar to cocaine, in fact. <clears throat> The increased incidence of marijuana abuse or dependence in 10 years has increased even though rates have not changed. And one possibility is that the marijuana cigarette has a much higher level of THC. I won't go into the cannabinoid thing, but I will just um, finish with two issues that are outstanding. One of the current controversies is should the burden of disease estimates include marijuana as a risk factor for psychosis? And these things should be, these things should be debated in all public policy and public health circles. Our conclusions are that the cannabinoid system of the brain and other organs modifies numerous bodily functions. And it's because these cannabinoids affect how much chemical signals are released over a wide range of signals. Marijuana invades the cannabinoid system of the brain and it changes the endogenous cannabinoid signaling pathway. And the implications of these changes are only beginning to be understood. We know that in adolescence, the use is associated with higher susceptibility to becoming addicted to marijuana or other drugs. Use is associated with other consequences, compromised education, changes in cognitive function and brain structure. And in adults, early use is associated with higher susceptibility to psychosis and to schizophrenia. I thank you.